Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we come back to the 11th chapter in Daniel tonight in verses 2 to 20. And as we do so, we're, as I mentioned, focusing on God's sovereignty. And we explained last week how verse 1 of chapter 11 is really appropriately connected back with chapter 10 and Gabriel's message and announcement to Daniel, his strengthening of Daniel, and that indicated in the the grammar of the text, which is always what we look at. When we want to understand the Bible and what's being conveyed, we want to fundamentally consider what the original grammar is telling us and what the historical context is. Because the book is not written to us directly. It is written to the people of that particular era and then the application for us. So we see that back in chapter 10, the angel Gabriel was speaking and was encouraging Daniel, and this all a function of Daniel's final vision here in chapters 10 to 12. So we saw that Daniel was stunned by this vision that he had in verse 1 of chapter 10, and that three times through the chapter, the angel needs to strengthen him literally just to get off his face because he is so overwhelmed with the grief of what's gone on. And although we don't understand the nuances or the depth of what Daniel was dealing with in this prophetic revelation from God, I think we all understand times in our lives where the grief has been so significant, we found it difficult to get up. And so we understand the gravity of what was going on in Daniel's life. And and he was overwhelmed by this because not only was that 70 years of judgment, which he knew was coming to an end because of Jeremiah's writing, as proclaimed in Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29, and that it was going to go on, that 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 continued judgment of the nation of Israel was going to go on because of their continued unfaithfulness, and per the 70-week vision that it was going to go on for at least another 490 years, which was horrific. But now in verse 14 of chapter 10, he's told that it's going to go on to the end of time. That is until the return of their Messiah for the second coming, that they would continue to be in judgment for another 2,500 years and counting. And this overwhelmed Daniel. This is a man who was all about his country, all about his nation, continually bringing them before the Lord. And this absolutely devastated him. And now in chapter 11, the angel explains the vision that Daniel saw back in verse 1 of chapter 10. In the first verses of chapter 11, we saw our first point, the intermediate action there in your outline in your prayer guide. And in verse 2, we saw the four major kings that were described for us of Media Persia. That is the four kings after the current king Cyrus. And we know how important this was. We saw the the dating of the prophecy, which is in the third year of King Cyrus, again, back from Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1, this all one unit, chapters 10 to 12, and that we know that that time frame from biblical and extra biblical evidence was 536 B.C., I know last year or last week, uh, repeatedly, I think I said A.D. for the first few mentions of time, so forgive me for that. It should have been B.C., most of you know that, but uh, we'll try to keep that correct tonight. So the timing of this prophecy that Daniel received is 536 B.C., and the king, again, was King Cyrus. This is the king who in Isaiah 44 was called by name by God in God's prophecy to Isaiah before he was even born. 150 years before he was born, before Media Persia even had a thought of conquering Babylon. And fascinating to recognize that this is the first king. Then we had the Darius the Mede, who was kind of a co-regent, who was the ruler over Babylon when Media Persia defeated Babylon, but was not the king. We mentioned the names of the four kings that followed. Cyrus, which were Cambyses, Smyrtus, Darius the first, and Xerxes the first. All of these, with the exception of Smyrtus, 
being attested to in other books of the Bible, in Esther, in Ezra, in Nehemiah. And in that, we understand the inerrancy and the inspiration of God's word. Were any two of us to try to sit down and to detail uh, uh, but a few minutes worth of events, our differing perspectives would doubtlessly cause confusion and even potentially err in those factual details that we were attempting to recount. Here we have four different books of the Bible that are recounting the events of a, a group of Israelites and their interaction in captivity, and there is perfect harmony with those being written by different authors, which is only divine, because again, that could never happen at a human level. And all of the multiplying attested in the, the extra biblical uh, sources that are talked about here. So not only do we have this in scripture, but we see it in several other extra biblical uh, resources such as the, the Babylonian um, archives, in the Media Persian archives, in the Greek archives, in individual monographs that have been written historically about those, all the way from that time dating into the beginning of the New Testament. And we'll talk about some of those this evening. And we alluded that there were four more Persian kings after Xerxes. So the question arises. How do we say that it was exactly these four kings that are being spoken about? If there are eight that are questionable, couldn't it have been any four in there? Well, theoretically, yes. But when we looked at the text, which is where we always want to come back to for our understanding, not our own perspective, but in the text, we saw very clearly that this had to be those four kings, Cambus, Smyrtus, Darius, and Xerxes, because of the description in verse 2 of that final king. A fourth will gain more riches than all of them, soon become strong through his riches, and he will arouse the whole empire against the realm of Greece. In chapter 11 and verse 2. That was only Xerxes the first. He was the only one who had the money to do that. He was the only one who amassed the army to do that. And following him because of that failed military effort. Where that tiny nation of Greece whipped up on both the army and navy of Media Persia. It left them really very very weak. And we also see it specifically detailed in the book of Esther. So all of these incredible understandings of these sources. And when, so we recognize it had to be these individuals. Verses three and four described Alexander the Great and his three and a half year conquest of the entire world. And so much behind that. And I'd encourage you, go back and listen to last week's message and refresh yourself on that because it, it's fantastic. Never before or since has there been a conqueror to take the entire modern world, never in that fashion, and in so doing, to bring one language into all of the peoples of the world in Greek. It, it, again, truly a divine effort and conception. So as we understand all of these things, then we saw Alexander's early death and the division of his kingdom into four parts. The two primary parts being described as the north and the south, and that with respect to the nation of Israel. And you remember geographically how vital Israel is, that it's a land bridge that connects all of the continents north, Asia, Asia Minor, and Europe down to Africa. Because there, if, again, if we look at a map and we think of this as the western side, outside the western edge of Israel is the Mediterranean. The vertical eastern border is the Arabian Desert. 600 miles of sand. There's no going across that. So if you want to move militarily in the ancient world, you have to go through Israel. Not only was it a rich land based on the crops, based on the timber and all that was there at that time, but militarily it was critical. And so we see this coming to full vent in our text tonight. Again, the kings of the north are the kings of Syria and the Seleucids. 
and the kings of the south are the kings of Egypt and the Ptolemies or the Ptolemies as some say. I say the P, there's no necessarily right or wrong pronunciation. But uh, so the Syrians with the S are the Seleucids, the Ptolemies are the kings of Egypt. And you'll note from your sheet, and this is really important, okay, I hope you've all got your little sheet with you still that I told you was really critical and never to have it leave you, is um, the description of this time frame. So we're going to use this a whole bunch tonight. And what we're going to recognize is that all of this began in 323 BC. That's at the death of Alexander the Great. His premature death at 32 years old after conquering the entire world at 24 and his partitioning up or of the, not his, but of the partitioning up of his empire to these four separate groups that are described as the four winds of heaven or the four points on a compass in the, the new American standard. So, the, the Seleucid dynasty, you note on your chart, doesn't start for 11 years after 323. And that's because King Ptolemy I was in Egypt. And that was a very easy area to control because he also controlled Israel. And so he had an easy time caring for his land and keeping it to himself. Another general of Alexander, Antigonus began to come and conquer the other regions of Asia Minor and into Europe and even into northern Syria. And he forced the Seleucids out of their area and they made an alliance with, with Ptolemy I. So this forced the union that we saw in verse 5. And this, this introduced to us these two main antagonists that are going to continue through verses 5 to 20. That is the king of the north and the king of the south. The north in Syria being the Seleucids, the south in Egypt being the Ptolemies. And so that takes us to, back to our text tonight, which I've titled Astounding Accuracy and Intrigue. And boy, do we see that big tonight. And then the theme, three revelatory stages affirming to you God's sovereignty. And how that all comes to fruition is the understanding that this is a prophetic text that was given to Daniel, as we mentioned, in 536 B.C., and we're going to see specificity in the events of these matters that occur from 323 B.C. down to about 200 B.C. that are only in divine prophecy from God who understands and is outside of time, knowing the beginning and the end, that we could have such exact detail that comes forward. So that takes us then to our second point, which I've titled the initial alliance, the initial alliance in verses six to nine. Let's look at those verses and Daniel chapter 11, beginning in verse six. After some years, they will form an alliance and the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north to carry out a peaceful arrangement, but she will not retain her position of power, nor will he remain with his power. But she will be given up along with those who brought her in and the ones who sired her as well as he who supported her in those times. But one of the descendants of her line will arise in his place and he will come against their army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and he will deal with them and display great strength. Also their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold, he will take into captivity to Egypt. And he, on his part, will refrain from attacking the king of the north for some years. Then the latter will enter the realm of the king of the south, but will return to his own land. So now understanding the prophetic text... Let's bring the historical details that we now have accounted not only in scripture in the four books I've mentioned, but throughout the extra biblical resources to recognize the specificity that's detailed here. After the deaths of the two first kings of the north and south, Ptolemy I and Seleucus I, just 
over one year apart, their sons are now warring over Israel. Again, Israel is the key. It is the land bridge. It is the, when it comes to military conquest, the, the, par, the party that holds Israel holds control over their land because it's such a narrow area to be able to protect all that lies either above to the north or below to the south. So now these two sons are warring over Israel in what's become known as the, and is well attested to, in the first Syrian war of 275 to 271 BC. And this is where Ptolemy II initiated war against Antiochus I. And you can see your chart there that describes these kings and their time frame. For these two second kings. Now the attack was unsuccessful as Tanner notes. And after the death of Antiochus I. And a, a second Syrian war broke out between Antiochus II and Ptolemy II. And this ended in the peaceful arrangement of verse 6. Where Ptolemy II's daughter Bernice was brought to Antiochus II with much gold and much silver to be his wife. And this was in 252 BC at the conclusion of this war. Excuse me, 272 BC at the conclusion of this war. Antiochus II already had a wife. So this gift was uh, from Ptolemy was sort of a gift and sort of not. Well, apparently she was something pretty special so Antiochus decides to put away and divorce his wife and children that he had and he sends them off to Ephesus so that he can take Bernice to be his new wife. And the plan was that Bernice's children by Antiochus would then be his heirs to the throne. You can see the mindset of the Ptolemies in why they would do so. We're going to get control of this thing. So I'm going to send you my daughter. I'm going to send an entourage of people from Egypt to protect her. I'm not just sending her in. And I'm going to send all this money with her. Well, that seemed like a good thing. However, Antiochus II died suddenly after a poisoning event that many suspect was after his uh, inappropriate revisitation to his previous wife in Ephesus. And as soon as she had poisoned Antiochus II, she told everyone that before he died, that he had said that her children should be the heir to the throne. And therein he has Bernice and her children and all of the entourage from Egypt murdered. And this is exactly fitting with what we see in the text. This is what's spoken about in verse 6. And the king of the south coming to the king of the north to carry this peaceful arrangement. And she, the wife, um, will not retain her position of power. And indeed, where it says there in verse 6 that she will be given up. That, that Hebrew phrase means that she would be martyred and killed as, as were her children. And so this is, again, the exact detail of the prophecy that we see given 185 years prior. So in verse 7, one of the descendants of her line is the brother of Bernice, Ptolemy III, and hearing the, of the murder of her sister and her children and the Egyptian entourage, he attacks Seleucus II. And this campaign of Ptolemy III is described as the most successful Egyptian campaign that they would ever undertake. Verse 7 tells us that he overtook their fortress or their palace. And sources say that he marched on through Asia Minor all the way to Mesopotamia, continuing to win military victories. So after this horrific act that the ex-wife proliferates on the king and on the new wife, then the brother who is remaining in Egypt now comes in and storms in and starts taking conquest of all of this region. Verse 8 continues to describe this conquest 
where it says for us, also their gods, their metal images, and their precious vessels of silver and gold he will take into captivity to Egypt, and he on his part will refrain from attacking the king of the north for some years. What this tells us is he's going in to pillage and plunder. He's going in for cash. He's going in for the gold, and the majority of the gold and silver would be in their idols. Furthermore, in the ancient world, when the idols of a nation were taken captive, it was believed by those peoples that their gods had given them over. So there was a, a, an idea that, that he had won victory by taking these idols. So we understand that Ptolemy III then returned to Egypt. He didn't directly take on the, the next king. And he did so because there was a skirmish back in Egypt of native Egyptians. And he did not return to fight in the north in a major campaign. So this was the last major north incursion that the Ptolemies would make in verse 8. However, it wasn't over between these two. That is between Ptolemy III and Seleucus II as verse 9 reveals. And it says there, then the latter will enter the realm of the king of the south, but will return to his own land. This was a brief battle that resulted in a peace accord, which was very favorable to the, to the Ptolemies. This was because Seleucus II was badly beaten. And in his defeat, he was forced to sign a peace treaty. And in that peace treaty, it included giving the Ptolemies the port city of what was called Seleucia Pieria, which was the capital of Antioch. Now, from our New Testament history, we know a little bit about Antioch, don't we? It's the place in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, which we're going to be getting to shortly in our Sunday morning series, where people were first called Christians, little Christs. And it was a derogatory term that was used against them. That they were these people following this foolish man. And they loved the term. And they took it on gladly. But Antioch, we know, is north of Israel. So the fact that in this treaty, he gets a major seaport north of Israel and well into the middle of the Syrian Seleucid dynasty was a huge victory. And he had won a tremendous amount of this. This is doubtlessly the reason he wanted it because of the naval superiority that the, the Ptolemies from Egypt had. So this is a, a, an amazing little piece of insight into the geography of that battle that's ongoing. And that takes us to our third point, the inception of aggression in verse 10. Look at verse 10 to 13 with me. His sons will mobilize and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one of them will keep on coming and overflow and pass through that he may again wage war up to his very fortress. The king of the south will be enraged and go forth and fight with the king of the north. Then the latter will raise a great multitude, but that multitude will be given into the hand of the former. When the multitude is carried away, his heart will be lifted up and he will cause tens of thousands to fall, yet he will not prevail. For the king of the north will again raise a greater multitude than the former and after an interval of some years, he will press on with a great army and much equipment. So as we've moved through these verses, we began with our first two kings, Ptolemy and Seleucus, who passed away. Ptolemy II comes in, and he then is fighting against Antiochus I and II, and eventually into the time of Seleucus II, who is fighting against Ptolemy III. And that's basically where we are. And we had this final last conquest of the Ptolemies north under Ptolemy III. And that's how we, where we are when we come to verse 10. And in verse 10, notice that it talks about his sons will mobilize, plural. It's a very important distinction there and very accurate because it's describing Seleucus III and Antiochus III. 
both of them sons of Seleucus II. Seleucus III was the oldest. He was the king that took his father's place and his army west while his brother Antiochus went east. Seleucus III is killed by his own men in this aggression. And so that makes his brother Antiochus III the next king. The one we see is Antiochus the Great. We'll talk about why that is in just a minute. And at this time, almost concurrent with this, Ptolemy III dies and he is replaced by his son Ptolemy IV, who is a, a weak ruler and who empowers Antiochus III to engage him in what becomes the Fourth Syrian War. Antiochus III's army is larger and powerful, and it enters to Ptolemy IV's capital. And that's what we see spoken about in verse 10. And then in verse 11, Ptolemy IV had no choice but to fight, and so he assembles an army to fight this massive entourage of the Seleucid army from the north, and Antiochus III. And the, in this battle, amazingly, despite the power of the northern army of Antiochus III, the Ptolemies win. And, and the details of this battle in the Syrian wars are incredible. I mean, we're talking about numbers of soldiers that are like 60,000 and 70,000. And the army of the, uh, of the Seleucids from the north and Antiochus III came in with nearly 100 elephants as part of their war machine. Which when you're fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat and an ele elephant's coming in, you got a problem. And yet somehow uh, the Ptolemies were able to secure also 103 African elements, which were larger and more significant. And they also secured a huge warrior force of the Nabataean army, this very vicious army from Africa that came in and helped them. And thus they win the war. But what do we know about that king? He's a weak ruler. And so the, in verse 12, the multitudes are carried away in verse 12 are the devastated army of Antiochus III. One commentator reports that the Seleucids lost 14,000 soldiers in this battle in one day. This made Ptolemy again very arrogant as verse 12 tells us. But he did not take advantage of his military victory to press back to the north because he was more concerned with a, a lascivious lifestyle of partying. And so he turns this into this great, this, this military victory into this huge party because he had no military acumen. And then in verse 13, Antiochus III raises an even greater army and comes against Egypt and the Ptolemies. And the return battle is what's described in verses 14 to 20. Let's look at that. Now in those times, many will rise up against the king of the south. So Antiochus III has gone back home, badly defeated. He raises up another huge army and he comes back against the king of the south because he would not raise an army for himself and come against this ruler, Ptolemy IV. So he comes back, uh, picking it back up in verse, verse 14. Now in those times, many will rise up against the king of the south. The violent ones among your people will also lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they will fall down. Then the king of the north will come, cast up a siege ramp, and capture a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground, not even their choicest troops, for there will be no strength to make a stand. But he who comes against him will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land with destruction in his hand. He will set his face to come with the power of his whole kingdom, bringing with him a proposal of peace, which he will put into effect. He will also give him the daughter of women to ruin it. 
but she will not take a stand for him or be on his side. Then he will turn his face to the coastlands and capture many. But a commander will put a stop to his scorn against him. Moreover, he will repay him for his scorn. So he will turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he will stumble and fall and be found no more. Then in his place, one will arise who will send an oppressor through the jewel of his kingdom. Yet within a few days, he will be shattered, though not in anger nor in battle. So as we look at this uh, oncoming deluge, Antiochus III had many military victories after he'd gone back home, back up in the, north, the regions of Syria and even into Iraq and Iran in the northern areas and towards Asia Minor and Turkey. And he was also making entries towards Asia, towards Western Asia Minor. And as he did so, he was building his army up. So he had a tremendous army that he was amassing. And this is why all of these victories in the north, why he earned the name Antiochus III the Great. This was in keeping with Alexander the Great because this was the largest land mass that ever was brought forth by a king following Alexander the Great. And so he was a very dominant military force. And these are the many that will rise up in verse 14. In addition to this, a group of Jewish assassins will join in the coup against the Ptolemies. And these are the ones that we see described as the violent ones among your people. So they join in because what's happening? Well, they're under Ptolemy IV. They've been almost continually underneath the rule of Egypt. And this guy... He's a partier, and all he wants to do is have all of these lascivious conquests. And so they're getting basically taxed, and they're getting taken advantage of, and they're tired of it. So when Antiochus III comes down, these Jewish people are like, we'll go with you, and they prepare to come and to take him on as well. But what we find out is that in this effort that it was unsuccessful. The first thing we understand is first that Ptolemy IV dies uh, almost at the beginning of this movement by Antiochus III towards Egypt. And Ptolemy V takes over, although he is only a child. In fact, he is uh, maybe as young as eight or ten years old when he is made king. So the Jews that are disgusted with the debauchery of Ptolemy IV and his horrible governing of Israel, these again are the violent ones. And it's unclear what the vision of verse 14 that they saw was referencing, but their efforts fail as verse 14 tells us. They will fall down. Their stumbling in verse 14 is at the hand of a governor that Ptolemy V, through his advisors, this kid had placed, Philip V of Macedonia, had placed in Israel. And he was on the, the coastland of Israel, so that when these assassins were ready to join with, Patol, or with Antiochus III, this governor came and he took them out. And so this is their stumbling. He put down the Jewish revolt. And so the Potomac victory in Israel secured the southern coastland and the cities of Antiochus III. And we'll see that that'll become important. All of the, the nuances of these battles are, are fascinating. So in 200 BC, Antiochus III will gain victory over Philip V because now he, after the Jews are defeated by this governor... Antiochus III comes down and he takes out the governor. So for the first time, the Syrians and the Seleucids now control Israel. They've warred over it back and forth and through it, but they've never been able to secure it. This is the first time that they secure Israel. And this will be the last time that the Egyptians ever have control of that land as he moves down and in through it. So Ptolemy comes in and, and he takes out uh, Philip V 
so that there's no more support from there. And so then at this battle that's going on, Antiochus puts up a siege wall and captures Philip the fifth and with him the best of the fighting forces of the Ptolemies. And this is what we see in verse 15. This is the siege wall. This is all about Philip and his being taken out. And then in verse 16, it describes the true prize of this fifth Syrian war that's going on. And we see it there where it says, but he who comes against him will do as he pleases. This is Antiochus III, the great, will do as he pleases and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land with destruction in his hand. So as he comes in, Antiochus III is massively powerful. And now he's taken control of what was arguably the Ptolemy's major fighting force and this governor, the Philip V, that had been hired. But rather than tearing right on down into Egypt, the king decides he's going to bask in this victory for a little bit. They now have Israel. They now possess and control the land bridge. So he decides he's going to hang out there for a while and enjoy his victory in the beautiful land. And he does as he pleases and he stays in Israel. And the phrase destruction in his hands at the end of verse 16 indicates both his power and the control of this critical land bridge. They've been fighting for this forever. And now he has it. So he now has destruction, or literally in the Hebrew, annihilation in his hand. And as Antiochus III's reign continues in verse 17, a new power is building in the West that we're going to see come up in another verse. Antiochus in verse 17 has a ploy for ruling the entire empire in verse 17, which is a false ploy for peace. Remember earlier? We saw that the, the king of the Ptolemies sends in Bernice to marry the king of the north, and that falls apart. Well, Antiochus III is thinking, hey, that's a good idea. I'm going to send a woman down, and now this is going to down to be with Ptolemy V, this child who now is perhaps in his mid-teens, and so I'm going to send this little older woman to come in. She is going to come in and she's going to marry this Egyptian king and she's going to help turn this whole thing my way. So I'm not even going to have to fight. Well, you may know and notice what she's called in verse 17. The daughter of women to ruin it. Who could that be? Well, you may have heard of this woman. Her name was Cleopatra. And we know much about the power and the conquest that Cleopatra brought forward when she was in Egypt and when she married Ptolemy V. She wasn't going to be controlled by her brother. She saw an opportunity to gain power. So she said, enough with your plans. I am going to step up and I am going to support my husband and I'm going to support this country and I'm going to gain power. So she will not take a stand for him or be on his side. And then in verse 18, Antiochus III, with a failed effort in Egypt, because now he doesn't have the superiority. He's been hanging out. And as he's been hanging out, keep in mind, this is a, a, a very violent world where if you're not right there to control those lands that you take, those people that are still around will come and take them back. So he's been hanging out in the beautiful land and he has lost much and he is, does not have what he thought would be an army to go forward because he didn't think he'd need it. So in his failed effort, he turns to the Mediterranean, he turns back north, back to his stronghold, still having Israel and he starts to move to the west. He starts to move to Greece. He starts to move to Macedonia. And he starts to move towards another power that we've heard spoken much about and that we see coming forward in verse 18. He'll turn his face to the coastlands. This is the Western Mediterranean. He'll capture many, but a commander will put a stop to that scorn. This commander is the new commander of the enveloping Roman army. 
And now the Romans have started to amass an empire. And they have begun to take over some of the northern regions. They are in complete control of Europe at this time. And so they, Ptolemy III brings up the ire of the Roman legion. And Rome comes and defeats Antiochus III, driving him out of the western Mediterranean and back to Syria. And he was also required to sign what is called the Treaty, uh, the, excuse me, the Treaty of Pamea in 188 BC. This was a, an incredibly important treaty. The effect of this treaty, treaty required a tribute of gold paid each year to Rome and 20 hostages given to Rome of significance. Sounds very much like the captivity of the Jews to Babylon, don't you think? Where they came in and they, they looted the temple and they took the gold and the silver and all of the instruments of the sacrificial system and they took all of the youth of the princes and kings, which is where Daniel was taken captive. So he has to send these 20 hostages and one of those hostages of this king, Antiochus III the Great, is his son Mithridates, his second oldest son, who would become, and this has becomes critically important, so the son who was sent as a captive to Rome as a hostage will become Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the one who most of the rest of the 11th chapter of Daniel is about. So for the gold he, he had some gold, but this is a huge amount. So he returns back to Syria, to his capital, moves beyond it to Susa, which was the previous capital of the Medes and Persians. And they had started, the Parthites, Parthenites had taken back Susa. So he goes back to wage war with them to get the gold to be able to pay Rome. And as he does so in fighting against them, he's killed. So Antiochus III is now dead. That brings his son, Seleucus IV, to rule in verse 20. And you see him there as right below Antiochus III, Seleucus IV. So his son takes over from him. And Seleucus IV was greedy. And he owed Rome a significant tribute and as such, he sent a tax collector to Israel, the jewel of the kingdom. Because we know one thing about the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, whether they are in captivity or whether they are at home, financially they thrive. And so he thinks, okay, here's my cash cow. I'm going to go back down now that we have possession of this and I'm going to tax these people and they are going to pay me. Well, the tax collector that he returns with this huge tribute because Israel has been militarily decimated with the conquest of the assassins earlier. And the tax collector decides he's going to take things into his own hands. I've now got the gold. And the second in command or the, the second son of Antiochus III has been taken to Rome. All I've got to do is take out the king and I'm the new king. I like that idea. So that's exactly what he does. He comes back and he murders Seleucus IV and he takes the throne. Interestingly, this particular period of history is very keenly detailed in 2 Maccabees. And we see that as well as in the other historical accounts. So as we understand this transition, we've now come all the way through these kings, all the way through the Ptolemies and all the way through the Seleucids. And now we have Seleucus IV dead. We have Antiochus IV in captivity. And we have Ptolemy VI sitting down in Egypt. And we'll see how that plays out as we continue forward. But there's so many details that come out in this text. Think about all of the historical events we've just described that are specifically and prophetically brought forward in such accuracy that we now see 
Again, from a historical perspective, that what was foretold 180 to 200 years prior was keenly specific, down to the meaning of the names, the daughter of women, and how important Cleopatra would be in that role, and a title she would take to herself. We also see the incredible significance of the land of Israel, not just because of its riches, but because of the military facet. And the amazingly corrupt and power-hungry perspective of these wicked human rulers. Those which were never content with all that they had. But they had to continue to war. They had to con continue to come forward. And it's no different today. It has been that way throughout history when we think of, of men like Stalin and Lenin and Hitler and Pol Pot and, and Mao. When we think of, of men like Putin. It doesn't change the heart of man is desperately wicked, as Jeremiah tells us. Who can know it? We can't know our own hearts. And this comes forward so powerfully. And not only in all of the wickedness that we've seen, that a worse ruler than all of these is coming in Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he is going to be the most horrific of this group by far. Worse than any of those that have been before, but one who is foretelling yet a worse ruler to come in Antichrist. And the persecution to God's people is almost certainly to come to us. Do you remember what the New Testament says in 1 Corinthians 10 about why the Old Testament is written? It is written to give us instruction. Part of that instruction is the suffering and the judgment and the punishment that has gone on to the nation of Israel that we can expect is likely to continue and to come forward as we see the uh, closening time of Christ's return. And as Christians, we're to understand how we're to live in all of this. Not to fight, as we're told in the New Testament, but to live radically different lives, as Tanner notes. To love one another per John 13, 35. Because as the world sees us love one another and love those around us, they will understand that we are different. And that this is the message that we're to convey by the love that we show to one another and to the world. That we're even told to love our enemies. To do good to those who hate us. To those to slap us on the cheek, on the right cheek, to give them the left also. And that this is radically countercultural. And in this, so that we may serve, so that we may show our role is not to rise up and to revolt, but it is to serve, it is to reflect Christ to those around us. To as scripture tells us, to lay down our lives for others. If it even comes, beloved, to the point of our martyrdom, to not fight that, but to live Christ out in that. What did Christ do? The one who took on himself all of the sin of the world and died on the cross for us. And that we are to remember, to remember keenly that it is better to be a servant and even a martyr in this day and this age so that we may rule with Christ in eternity rather than seeking somehow to rule now in a world that we know is passing away. Because this is the reality of what we're to be and to do. And this is the reality of these lessons. God has given us these truths so that we could see his sovereignty. We could see the specificity of what he's doing. How comforting is that when we have difficulty in our lives? When we have family member after family member suffering, when one sister has cancer and another one breaks her arm and needs surgery and, and my wife needs back surgery, when, you know, my, my, my father is failing in health and passes away and then my mother's health is failing and passes away and then my stepmom is having all sorts of trouble and I'm having to deal with that and my, my daughter-in-law has a horrific heart event at a young age and is completely incapacitated and doesn't look like she'll survive with her young son and, and my wife's father has a stroke. How do we deal with that? By recognizing God is sovereign 
And he's using all of it. He's using all in the tragedy in every one of our lives to open our eyes to who he is so that we can trust him. So that we can know that whatever befalls us, that we have an eternity that is secure in heaven because of Christ. But as Paul says, these are momentary light afflictions in light of the surpassing glory that awaits us. And that we can give that message to others and we can show that message to the world around us who so desperately needs to hear it and see it because much of the world is living just like these buffoons. Let's just get all we can get. Let's kill all we can kill because it's all about me. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. And he's the one that we need to continue to reflect, to trust in, and to glorify, understanding how keenly and specifically he's shown us his plan. Pray that plan will encourage your heart tonight as we continue to study this and as we understand the world about us, that whether we recognize all the details or not, we can recognize that our God reigns, amen? And that he is sovereign and that he is working through every detail. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this detail of these many kings and complexity beyond measure. And Lord, that you would foretell this hundreds of years before the event. And, and it's not as though this were all of it. As you foretold the king who would turn the nation of Israel and give them opportunity to return from their captivity in Cyrus. As you foretold time and time again through the prophets all that was going to happen to Israel and to Judah for their wickedness. As you foretold most beautifully and incredibly the coming of your son, Jesus Christ, who would suffer more than any man, who would be marred more than any man, who by his stripes we would be healed and who would indeed, though he would suffer to death, would see his offspring as you would raise him from the dead. For there is none. There are none like your son, Father. There is none like you, Jesus. There are no gods. There are no religious leaders that are raised and are living and are preparing to return to draw home those who would but bow the knee. Lord, may we proclaim this message with all of the strength and all of the power and all of the love that we can because you are glorious beyond measure and we want the world to know you. Thank you for our time together tonight. Glorify us and keep us safe until you draw us together again and we'll give you thanks, praying it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Julian.